While the principal actors waited in the wings, the great drama of America's civil rights movement was being rehearsed in Louisiana's capital city. The Baton Rouge boycott was like a call in the dark. It gave hundreds of thousands of other African Americans in the South hope. Hope and a sign that change was coming. This program was supported in part by funds from a grant from Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities, a state affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities, by the Louisiana Division of the Arts, and by the Arts Council of Greater Baton Rouge through the Decentralized Arts Funding Program. Other assistance provided by When my spirit's in turmoil and pain Before Dr. King had a dream Before Rosa Parks kept her seat Before Montgomery stood its ground Baton Rouge, Louisiana took a bold first step In 1953, the African American citizens of Louisiana's capital city led a quiet revolt Two years before the famous bus boycott in Montgomery, Alabama captured national attention, the black citizens of Baton Rouge staged the nation's first large-scale bus boycott, challenging segregation. The Baton Rouge bus boycott stands in history truly as the template for what's later going to occur in the Montgomery bus boycott. This is a fact attested to by the individuals involved, in specific Martin Luther King Jr. Rosa Parks uh, was very influenced by what occurred in Baton Rouge. Uh, and in fact, it became legendary in the NAACP circles. The, the sheer fact that they, they could boycott the buses for a week and do this in a very disciplined way was an example. And it showed that white supremacy was not something that was simply going to be accepted by black people in the South, that the change was in the air. I brought my son Johnny Jr. and uh, we, he wanted to, every time he would see a bus, he would just say, "Woo, that, that!" I said, "Okay, well, I'm gonna let you ride the bus." As soon as the bus stopped and the bus the door opened, I put him upon the first step. He just ran into the bus and popped down on the first seat, and the bus driver got up and in a rage and just stood up and started to shouting at him like I don't know what before I could even pay him. And uh, you, know, you crying, don't, don't cry. And I said, don't, don't worry about it, son. Daddy will take care of it. Come on, let, let's go on back to the back. I just told him that Daddy would be doing something about that. I wasn't a lawyer then. Trouble will soon be over. Son will have an end. Trouble will soon be over. Son will have an end. I work domestic work, cook, clean up mind the children and it was hard to get up early in the morning to go to catch the bus stand up all the way to the bus walking and stand up waiting on the bus get on the bus you got to stand up and when you get on the job you didn't want you sitting down you had to work and when i leave it's the same thing go to the corner you got to stand up get on the bus you got to stand up you go come home i got a lot of work and a lot of things to do and I never know what a chair looked like. In 1953, African Americans made up 70% of the Baton Rouge Bus Company's business. Yet, like everywhere else in the Jim Crow South, black riders were restricted to the colored section of buses. One white person would get on the bus and sit way back. You couldn't sit ahead a of a white person. Then every, everybody else in the bus has to stand. 
a bus bus load of sixty some people, and and they all had to stand because one white person sat at the back. Baton Rouge's black community had a particular grievance against the city's bus service. In 1950, the city council revoked the licenses of nearly 40 African-American-owned bus services that transported residents from black neighborhoods to jobs and businesses within the city. The Baton Rouge Bus Company demanded a monopoly franchise on the city's public transportation routes. In return, the company pledged full and fair services to all riders. But the practical realities of segregation would make that pledge nearly impossible to keep. When you get on the bus, you only fill up a certain number of seats with lights. And when you see that's all, no more, no more, no more, no more, no, no, no more blacks, no more blacks, no more room, and there's a the seat for that vision. For somebody to use. No blanks. You have to get back. In many respects, Baton Rouge was like most segregated southern cities in 1953. But there were also important factors that made race relations in Baton Rouge different from other southern cities. Beginning in the late 1920s, political conditions for African Americans had slowly begun to improve under Governor Huey Long. The state had become one of the more progressive places in the South for African Americans to live and work. My father worked for the state uh, and had a mobile dental trailer, and we went all over the state. And actually, race relations, I thought, were pretty good. Huey Long and the Long family actually had a reputation of believing in separate but equal. They sort of put the emphasis on helping the poor, all of the poor, whether they were white or black. I think that created a kind of, of climate of acceptance. When Huey Long's younger brother Earl became governor in 1948, there were only 7,000 African Americans registered to vote in Louisiana. When he left office in 1952, that number had soared to 110,000. By far, Louisiana claimed the largest number of registered black voters in the South, 13 years before the Federal Voting Rights Act of 1965. We opened up this voter's rights school and started teaching students, you know, the citizen, how to vote. We would organize and vote in blocks. That's why we had the, the voters' leagues. In Scotlandville, that was the second ward. In Baton Rouge, in, the, in mostly the Eden Park area, First Ward Voters League. In our community, there was a number of uh, uh, colored citizens who could vote. You certainly made an uh, effort to secure their votes. I would say they could uh, just make a difference in the balance of, of power. Along with commanding more political power, Baton Rouge's African American community was different in another important respect. It had a sizable middle class that helped provide strong community leadership. A middle class made up of educated professionals and business owners, skilled laborers, industrial workers, and teachers. Just north of Baton Rouge was the African-American community of Scotlandville, home to Southern University. In the 1940s and 50s, Southern University was actually the central point for African Americans in the state of Louisiana. It not only educated the people in the community, but made sure that they were socially conscious and politically active in their communities when they returned home. Baton Rouge's black community had something else working in its favor. The energy and inspiration of a young Baptist preacher named Reverend T.J. Jemison. Jemison came here, a young man very bold, and others joined him. By January 1953, African Americans made up more than 10% of the registered voters, enough to decide the outcome of the mayoral election. Now black leaders enjoyed increasing influence with the city's new government. 
and quietly began the press for better treatment from the bus company. Then, in mid-February, the same day the bus company asked the city council to approve a fair increase, T.J. Jemison made a bold appearance before the all-white city council. I uh, spoke to them in brotherly terms and said to them that I thought that uh, since Negroes were paying the fare, the same fare that our white friends and residents were paying, that we should have the right to sit down. I say, that's no more than right. Two weeks later, without noted opposition and with the full support of the bus company, the city council unanimously approved Ordinance 222. Now, riders could fill the bus on a first-come, first-served basis. Blacks from the back and whites from the front. The bus company's drivers refused to honor the new seating regulations for three months. That day, I was just wore out. And the bus was crowded right up behind the guy's back. Wasn't but one seat right there in the front. A lady went, an older lady, sit down. And uh, then I went and sat down. He looked and saw that, and he said, get up. And I told him, I said, I'm so tired. I said, now, if any white people get on this bus, I'd be glad to get up and let them sit down. I said, but this bus is full of black folks and uh, I am tired, I need to sit down. I said, get up, and he wouldn't let us sit down there. A lady named Pearl, I never seen her, but she uh, took it under consideration. She said, now, everybody's gonna stick together this morning. Nobody gonna get off of this bus, and we gonna stick together. And the bus driver called the police to arrest them. And, and Reverend Jimmer was passing in his black Buick automobile and saw that the police had pulled them over, stopped the bus and pulled them over, and the police was coming up. But the police came and tried to make us get up and make us say, if you put them two in jail, you're going to have to put all of us in jail. He said, well, come on. All of us had done got up getting ready to go to jail. And uh, the Reverend Jemison, he came up and he knocked on his guys. The police showed him and said, now officer, you know you can't do that. That broke it up. The bus driver, Jemison, and the head of the bus company was trying to make the decision or whatever they was doing out there. His name was Cawthon. I'll never forget. He came to the uh, scene and said to the drivers, or uh, to the driver, uh, get back and drive the bus because the city council passed an ordinance that said they could sit down there and I agree, let them sit. And of course, they would not obey him. As local newspapers reported the incident at the time, Cawthon suspended the driver in response. The result was a walkout and four day strike by the bus drivers union. They saw it as the African American community wielding its political muscle and a white politician giving in to um, that kind of pressure. Looking for a way out of the situation, drivers' union leaders turned to State Attorney General Fred LeBlanc. He ruled that Ordinance 222 violated Louisiana segregation laws and overturned it. Word of that decision ended the drivers' strike on June 18th, but it galvanized the African American community. They had put out an announcement that they would have a meeting that night, and the pit was full. African American church and civic leaders from all over the city had come together to form the United Defense League. They selected Reverend T.J. Jemison as president. During the meeting that night, the group planned its next move and they start talking about what to do and how they're going to do it. And they end up saying that nobody ride the bus the next morning. You see? And everybody leave that place that night, knock on somebody's door all night if it takes it. Don't go home. Knock on the people's door and let them know that 
know black people's riding that bus next morning. And that's what we done. After the meeting, United Defense League Secretary Raymond Scott made a courageous announcement over the airwaves at WLCS Radio, the city's most popular station. He urged black citizens to refuse to ride city buses under the restrictions of the old ordinance. Scott announced that a carpool service would be available beginning the next morning for those in need of transportation. I woke up this morning when the man said I'm free. And that next morning, you, you crack your dough. The car, they're waiting for you. Wouldn't, you wouldn't know them from nobody. But everybody fell in line with that white and black. You hear me? Fell in line the best they could with that boycott. We had a car lift. I had 125 cars and trucks and everything that would roll. And we carried them, we picked them up and carried them to work. And we picked them up and brought them back home. The city bus would uh, drive along and the, and the blacks would just turn their back. Then they would, they would move on. Then those of us who had automobiles, we'd pick them up and take them where they wanted to go. And we couldn't charge them because we didn't have a license to charge. So what we did, we'd call mass meetings at night and take up an offering that would pay for the gas. And Horatio Thompson had the, the uh, service, the filling stations, and he would provide the gas. I couldn't give in a lot of money, but I, I did decide I'd let them have them gasoline in my cars, which was a sacrifice, but uh, I had to do something to support them. That morning, it delayed us from work. And when I got to work, I had to explain why I was late. She said that, oh, that'll never work. And some came from my toes all the way up out of my mouth and said, it will work long as it will work. That's what I told her, and that's all ever was said. The boycott had an immediate impact. According to bus company manager H. Flynn Cawthon, it was costing the service $1,600 a day. A continuation of this loss, he said, will ultimately mean we will have to cease operations. By June 17th, just six days into the boycott, the Baton Rouge Bus Company was on the verge of financial collapse. It would seem that the United Defense League had the upper hand. Then, to the surprise of many in the community, Jemison accepted a compromise brokered by the city council. It wasn't a complete first come, first served system um, because there would still be some seats at the front that were reserved for whites um, and some seats at the back that were reserved for African Americans, but fewer, fewer seats than before. The compromise ordinance was announced that night at the United Defense League's rally. We had a big meeting and Reverend Jimson was trying to tell the people not to boycott and so forth. And I can recall domestic people and whatnot. They say, well, no, we like it like it is. We don't have to ride the buses. Nothing wrong with our foots. We'll walk. And they were protesting. They were going to protest Reverend Jemison because they were ready for what? A change. And they could see a change coming. And this was the beginning of it. This kind of direct action was fairly new in the South. The idea of openly protesting against discrimination was seen as a dangerous thing to do. We had five bodyguards, men who wanted to, to come and help because we had had one or two crosses burned on our lawn. I think a fear factor hit him. I mean, this was Jim Crow South, and what he was doing was, was death over this. And I think as a man of the cloth, a religious leader, he was very worried about pushing forward a civil rights agenda. Still, when Jemison agreed to a compromise, 
Many in his community were shocked and angered, especially those in working class black neighborhoods who had no choice but to ride the buses. There's been a lot of places that have been critical of even making the agreement. But during that time, that was about all you could get. We started the bus boycott simply to get seats for the people. And once the, we got the seats, uh, what else was it for us to get? Are people right to be frustrated and feel more could have been done in that? Of course. But let's not lose sight of his role in American history. I mean, he was somebody who had the courage to stand up and his life, don't kid yourself, he was putting his life on the line. And he deserves to be treated as one of the great heroes of the civil rights movement. Um, not somebody who failed, but somebody who won because he was willing to try. The boycott could be regarded as a limited success in that the United Defense League gained a concession over segregation. They didn't walk away with nothing. In retrospect, as the civil rights movement unfolded and became more powerful, more militant, more assertive, that concession seemed disappointing. It seemed quite small. And the aftermath in Baton Rouge itself also seemed disappointing in that race relations got worse um, and that the, the white political leadership in Baton Rouge became more unyielding, more intransigent, uh, more sort of hardline segregationist. For many African Americans in Baton Rouge, the boycott may have failed to achieve everything they had hoped. But soon it became clear that the boycott's real success reached far outside the city limits. This boycott did make national news. The New York Times even covered the uh, bus boycott. The newspapers were, uh, especially African American newspapers, they were definitely interested in this story because it gave other African Americans across the nation some type of hope. The Baton Rouge boycott um, was like a, um, a call in the dark. It gave Rosa Parks and, and hundreds of thousands of other African Americans in the South hope that something similar could be enacted. People had the sense of what was possible. I think people sometimes forget that there had been other black ministers that had made attempts around the country, but it hadn't crystallized. They hadn't been able to get a sufficiently large group of other ministers or black people or their white allies to say, yes, this is a time, this is something we can stand together on. T.J. Jemison was able to do that in Baton Rouge. If the Baton Rouge boycott helped set the stage for the civil rights movement, then the curtain came up a year later. With its ruling in Brown versus Topeka Board of Education, the U.S. Supreme Court reversed the doctrine of separate but equal citizenship for African Americans. Rosa Parks said at that point, Baton Rouge got on all their minds because Baton Rouge didn't succeed because the thought was the federal government wasn't going to be on the side of African Americans. But after 54, it seemed that the Warren Court very well might be on the side and that hence what happened in Baton Rouge needed to be tested in some other southern city. When uh, Dr. King and others started the bus boycott in Montgomery, uh, and I talked with him, he mentioned the fact that this had been done uh, in uh, Baton Rouge much earlier. All of the people I interviewed from the Montgomery bus boycott all said Baton Rouge was on their mind. Anytime you're about to have an action, you're trying to look at a similar action and compare notes. So the lessons of Baton Rouge were not just what they were good at there, but also what they did wrong. That's what they're learning in Montgomery. There was simply the, the determination to confront segregation, and we didn't know how. So whenever somebody would demonstrate something, everybody else would uh, follow the demonstrations. I think that sometimes the history books focus so much on Montgomery, but they lose the root. And truly the tap root here is Baton Rouge, T.J. Jamison, and the pride, the courage that was demonstrated by people of Louisiana in not only establishing that bus boycott, but allowing it really to be resolved peacefully in a relatively short period of time. What happened in Baton Rouge was not premeditated, it wasn't staged, it came from the heart, it came from the soul. There's an authenticity to that bus boycott, which gives you a window into the frustrations of African Americans. And the boycott healed some of those frustrations in a way because it said this time we didn't win but it's just the first battle in a war. It gave them courage, let them know 
that that was a better day for blacks. But you had to fight for it. To see themselves organizing and bringing about things that they had held within them and were afraid to see.